it's a pleasure to be here. I do thank uh, the, the respective sponsors uh, for getting me over here. I do enjoy my trips to Australia. I particularly enjoy uh, farming, Australian farming people and people related to farming. Uh, and I particularly like the sense of humour, that dry wit that only Australians have. And the other thing I enjoy about coming to Australia, I always learn something new. Last time I was over here, I learned that it was an Australian who de developed, designed the original toilet seat. And it seems mean for me to point out that it was a Kiwi worked out that it works better if you cut a hole in the middle. <laughs> this time, I stepped off the plane in Adelaide yesterday, day before yesterday, whenever it was, uh, I had to go to the loo, went to the toilet, and there's a big sign up in the, in the toilet saying, the, the, um, the water in these toilets is not suitable for human consumption. Now, thanks so much for telling me that. You know, wait till I get home and tell the boys, no more straws in the toilet, boys, no more. I do enjoy uh, my time here with Australians. So we're going to talk about pseudoscience. I'm going to define what that is, and we're going to talk about why it's a danger and a threat to agriculture. Now, I've got to get something sorted out here. Why didn't they work? The challenge that we have, collectively, globally, is how do we feed 9 billion people in the year 2050? It's an important question and it needs to be addressed. I happen to have a cousin who works in the international uh, agricultural scene and he and a few of his colleagues got together and uh, looked at that question. How can we uh, develop how are we going to feed all these people? And they concluded uh, that it will require a sharp boost in research investment in plant agriculture from public and private sources accompanied by facilitating policies. Now, I just want to give you a brief insight of the sort of data they were looking at. Uh, and this is a, a data representing uh, grain yield in Mexico, as it turns out. Grain yield and t over time here. And the bottom graph shows the incremental increase in grain yield by commercial farmers. An incremental increase year by year. And we saw an example of that this morning uh, in terms of canola. The graph at the top there represents the same incremental increase, but that, they're the results of, of research trials. So the gap between there is technology transfer. How do we get all those farmers to grow crops like we know we can. So there, there is a twin challenge, if you like, uh, that we have to confront. Science and technology transfer. Both have to go hand in hand. So that's well and good, but when you pose that to, to people, lay people, people not familiar with science, and you talk to them about science, this is the sort of uh, expression you get. Total confusion. So how are we going to take these people on board if we're going to uh, achieve that goal? And if you dig down and talk to these people about why they're confused, typically the answers come along in this way. They'll say scientists are always arguing who the hell can we believe or trust? And that's particularly so in terms of global warming or steam cell research or genetic modification, to give some examples. Scientists are always arguing who, and how, how can, uh, uh, who can we trust? And so our, our laymen, and I don't want to be derogatory about that, I'm, I'm saying people not familiar with science are left with this quandary. Oh, I don't know who to believe. I'll just go back to my homeopathy or crystal gazing or horoscope reading or whatever have you. So we find ourselves at this time when science is most needed with a public uh, not particularly illiterate in terms of science. And so we are at a, at a crossroads. Science is, a respect for science is being eroded and uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that the technology transfer uh, pathway is littered with junk information. Now, as a kid, I, uh, I was brought up in the 50s and 60s, not far from the Ruroko Research Station, and in those days, in the 50s and 60s, agricultural science was put on a pedestal. It was greatly esteemed. So were the agricultural scientists. But today, that same respect is not afforded to this generation of scientists. And I've been wondering about that for some time, and it's taken me into reading about philosophy. 
Uh, now, I must admit uh, right up front, I'm not a philosopher by training. Uh, what I am about to tell you and, and give you a brief overview of, I have run past those who are uh, philosophers and they say this is a reasonable uh, uh, thumbnail sketch of the situation. The reason we are in this situation where science is required but society is, is off the pace is because of postmodern philosophy. And uh, I'll give you some examples of what that means. Postmodernism, postmodern philosophy. It says that the old meta-narratives should be questioned and possibly discarded. And just so happens that one of those meta-narratives um, is about science and technology. And the philosophers argued, well, the end result of, of the uh, Industrial Revolution, science and technology, was World War I, World War II, nuclear weapons. Science, we've got to get rid of that stuff, it's dangerous. Uh, and the other thought that comes uh, through on that is that truth is not absolute. Uh, truth uh, is uh, all opinions must be given equal weight. Uh, uh, we don't have to worry about the evidence. So that's in a nutshell what postmodernism philosophy is about. So the consequences of, of this philosophy on science is that science is undermined and it gives birth to this thing called pseudoscience. False science. Stuff that sounds like science, but it's not based on any evidence. So if you look back uh, over, over time, uh, these are some interesting reflections uh, to help you understand why we're in the position we are in, in, the, in the, at the moment. Go back to the Dark Ages. The truth was what was revealed by God uh, through um, the priest or whatever it might be. And the church was, of course, the authority. So if your crops failed, uh, the priest would have told you that stop fornicating, uh, stop sinning, and be a good boy, and your crops will come right, or some other thing, preferably give some money to the church, and you'll be right. Uh, that was the basic uh, idea. Then came the age of reason, the Enlightenment, the um, uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, you could say, where reason and, and, and logic and evidence uh, became described the truth, and science was the authority. So if your crop didn't work, you got a local scientist in, or a young fellow like we just heard, to find out why the crop failed. It might be the, those moths that he's talking about or whatever have you. Based on objective science reasoning. Postmodernism, the phase we're now in, says that, remember what I said before, all opinions are equal. What you believe is the truth. Doesn't matter where the evidence is, what you believe is your truth and you stick with it, brother. And so the individual is the authority. So in this case, uh, if your crop fails, uh, you go and read your horoscopes or you go and get some magic uh, dust, stardust, or, um, and there's any number of um, those type of muck and mystery products on the market. So at the moment, in, in the space of time, in, in my lifetime, we've got two, if you like, two tectonic plates of thought grating each, each other. One, reason, and the other, unreason. And we see examples of this duality uh, every day. You go down to, you call them pharmacies over here or chemist shop. Go down to the chemist shop and you'll find rows and rows and rows of alternative medicine. No proof required. Someone said they work and that's it. Ask for a genuine medicine, one that works, and, and you have to go and get a doctor's prescription. Uh, and, of course, the people who put those uh, products on the shelf have to pr uh, prove uh, efficacy. Huge duality in terms of what's happening there. Organic farming, biodynamics. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about that a, a bit later, but at the moment we, we hear a lot of people saying, uh, we're rushing to destruction, let's go back to organics. I'll talk a bit more about that later. To help you understand what pseudo, false science is, I'm going to give you a few examples uh, of what it sounds like and looks like. And you'll notice the use of scientific jargon words, but an absence of evidence. Uh, this is a quote from an Australian chap, actually, pleased to say, Graham State. Our chemical experiment using high leaching fertilizers has stripped the majority of the minerals from our soils. Really? Is that so? Uh, here's another one. Uh, science uses fear. We now have the lowest nutrient density in our food and we can relate that to what's happening health-wise. Another Australian, Dr Christine Jones. 
Why do you send them to our country? We don't need them anymore. Uh, an American, Dr. Arden Anderson, I think he probably parades himself around here from time to time. Why does conventional agriculture sanction and perpetuate the obscuring and demoting, uh, demoting of William Albrecht's landmark work in soil science? We'll talk a little bit about that later, the base saturation ratio nonsense. Uh, another example, uh, and this goes under the category of uh, if, it's, if it's too good to be true, uh, it possibly isn't true. Uh, Christine Jones again, things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, all these things uh, are related to the fact that we do not have enough trace elements in our bodies. Now, if that was really, really true, what would that do to the whole world of oncology? Hey, it'd be solved overnight. It's, it's so simple-minded that it cannot be true. Uh, another one is, uh, you'll hear people say, uh, we're tapping into some old wisdom that we've left behind. Our, our ancestors knew about this, blah, 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 blah. And then there's an example from Arden Anderson. Biological agriculture is a new paradigm. That's a fancy word. Uh, reki rekindling and modernising ancient wisdom. What a load of bikes. Notice that in those examples, a number of those examples, those pseudoscientists quite legitimately can call themselves PhD, doctor. So it's important for people to realise that the test for a pseudoscience is not the qualification they wear on their back or shoulders or wherever they wear it. It's the evidence that they present to support their opinion. And that's very important uh, to understand that. Now you could say, uh, laissez-faire, but well, does it matter? Who cares? You know, we're getting on with things. We're doing all right. Uh, so the question is, is there a legitimate and objective argument to say pseudoscience is dangerous and that it should not be tolerated in our society? I want to give you three examples. Example one, liquid fertilisers. I'm talking about these um, magic products but, uh, made from seaweed or some other organic material and they extract it down and, and you put on 10 to 12 litres per hectare and do, do all these magic things. I was involved in a prominent court case and uh, got sued for making comments about these products don't work. Um, and luckily we were able to prove that, well not luckily, the science was there. In the process I reviewed 810 trials internationally and we can show that these products are no better than the water they contain. Now, the research, the, the cost of that research, I've put up 16 million, but it might have been 32 million. The point is, all this money was wasted because if you had read the label and, and worked out what it contained and how it works, you would say, this product can't work. Wasted time, effort by research on, on that. Uh, Albrecht's cation uh, ratio theory, is it, are you familiar with this base saturation ratio? It's haunting us at home. I was up in uh, Hawaii at a... Uh, conference about soil testing and plant testing, and, and saying to these people who run these labs, why are you presenting this bullshit information which misleads farmers? There's no such thing as an ideal um, ratio of, of cations, uh, magnesium to calcium, or whatever have you. Uh, and the results lead, if you, if you practice it, you'll result in, in bad fertiliser advice, apply nutrients you do not need, or apply excess nutrients, uh, sorry, excess nutrients that you do not need, and not apply nutrients you do need. Hence, it leads to uh, in, uh, inefficient agriculture. And the third example, I'm, and I'm just expanding that a little bit more from what I said before, organic and biological farming. Uh, I sit at, at meetings and, 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 and we're talking about you know, how we're going to solve this environmental problem. And there are people legitimately around that table who are, are practising PCism saying, my opinion is we should be using XYZ product because it does a blah, blah, blah. What's the evidence? No evidence, but it's going to work, isn't it? Uh, this whole organic thing is, has, has gotten into our, our brains. It's crazy. We know from the science that uh, uh, organic uh, farms farming is about 68% less productive than conventional. So if the world went organic tomorrow, uh, we're going to have to either increase the amount of land under cultivation by... 30%, or we're going to have to kill a third of the population. And I reckon the line should go down there. You guys are out, all right? We're going to get rid of you. Uh, 
The science also says that manures are no better than fertilizers in terms of providing nutrients. In fact, they're worse because the nutrient ratios are trapped. Uh, they're no better for soil quality, believe it or not, and they're no better for the environment uh, than conventional fertilizers. So I will argue, till the day is uh, gone, that pseudoscience most certainly is wasteful. Uh, it's wasteful of science resources. It's misleading to farmers. And, and I see this every day, because these days I work one-on-one -on -one with farmers, it undermines farmers' confidence. They'll bring out an article they read last night in the newspaper saying, oh, it says here that superphosphate's going to kill the bugs in the soil. Bullshit. But it undermines the farmers' confidence. And that's not a good thing to have when we need to have farmers very confident of their game to produce all that food to feed all those people. And it costs uh, millions of dollars in lost production. Right, what should and can be done? Carl Sagan, the uh, American astronomer, one of my intellectual heroes, a um, uh, quote from him, the only an antidote to pseudoscience is science itself. And I agree entirely with that. Science must be asserted. But remember what I said at the outset. The public is confused at the moment about science and its importance. And so we have to take the public along with us in asserting science. We need to explain to, to the public that, that, yes, scientists will always argue. And normally those arguments take place in conferences or in the literature or whatever have you. Sometimes when they're really important socially, they spill out into, into, um, uh, into the newspapers, etc. Things like climate change, stem cell research are, are modern day examples. What I have found useful in trying to get uh, lay people to understand the value of science is to look backwards. I think the value of science is best seen looking backwards. Yes, we argue about these things at the time, but when enough evidence is in, we get over it and move on. Life moves on. Here's some examples. There used to be a big argument as to whether the Earth was flat or um, a big globe. It was a big argument. Uh, and, and you can understand the chap standing in the middle of the Nullarbor Plains, that's the only environment in you, saying, of course it's bloody flat. But if you stand back far enough, and if you gather enough in information, as the Apollo um, um, pilots took that photograph of, 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 the, of our globe, it most certainly is a globe. So a big issue had to be debated, but now we don't worry about it at all. Unless you remember the Flat Earth Society, of which there are probably uh, 20 branches in Australia, I don't know. Another good example is, the, remember the big argument about whether what, what was at the centre of our solar system, the Earth or the Sun? Uh, and this is where the church got involved because it was heresy to say that the, that, that the Earth wasn't. Poor old Galileo copped it uh, because he dared to say, here's some evidence that says this is not true, your biblical blah, blah, blah. So a big argument at the time, but now are we worried about that? Not really. Apply the same approach to something we're more familiar with. Uh, this depicts the um, human longevity uh, over time, uh, going way, way back, uh, and shows that over time, uh, humans live longer. Uh, now the figure is up to about 80, 80, I was going to say $80, 80 years. All because of science and technology. We are better fed, we have more leisure time because we don't have to work as hard, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we live longer. So how can Christine Jones say, oh, but we've got all these health problems. We're ruining ourselves. It's just not supported by the evidence. Another example, this time looking at agriculture. Data showing the productivity down here of agriculture in America, starting in 1775, going through to more or less up to date. Gradual improvement over time, especially steep toward the end. All to do with technology, all to do with science, all to do with better cultivars, better fertiliser practices, better management practices, etc., etc., etc. How can people say, uh, as one of those um, uh, Arden Anderson says, that we've destroyed the soils? If the production's increasing, I don't think we've destroyed the soils at all. Uh, quite the opposite. And a final example: the longest experiment. Running in soil fertility started in Rothamsted in 1850. 
in those early days. So we've got grain yield, this is wheat down here. Over time, starting 1850, uh, in those early days, we could grow a tonne of wheat per hectare. Same land, we're growing 10 tonnes because of science and technology. Better weed aside, pesticide, management, cultivars, etc., etc., etc. How can people say that we're destroying our soils? It just doesn't make sense against this evidence. So the point of the matter is that when, when you look at science through this lens of looking backwards and seeing where we've come from, uh, we see that we are a very, very clever ape. Now, I don't want you to take this personally. This is not about you personally, Australians. But I guess you're up here somewhere. <laughs> the big, yeah. uh, notice she's a girl. Uh, that, that, uh, don't take offence to that either. The fact is we are a clever ape. Uh, despite all the odds, so much has been achieved uh, by this clever little ape called the human being. And yet, bearing that in mind and contrasting that, look at what you see in the popular press. Nothing but doom and gloom. Why all the doom and gloom? If you look backwards and see how far we've come, it's a marvellous story. Uh, there's a quote here from Thomas Macaulay, I think it's perfect, and note he wrote this in 1830. On what principle is it that when we see nothing but improvement behind us, we are to expect nothing but deterioration before us? It doesn't stack up at all. So we need to re-educate ourselves about the importance of science. We need to re-educate re the, the lay people about the importance of science. And we need to be more confident about ourselves and our, our, and our important role in society as scientists. But we've also got to change science policy. Unfortunately, it's happened right around the world, particularly bad in, in New Zealand. Science has become commercialised and politicised. Science is now no longer about finding a truth. It's a commodity that you buy and trade. Uh, and that has ruined science. That's the, one of the reasons why I got out of institutional science. Uh, and I'm pleased I did. Uh, so this trend over the last 20 years of commercialising and politicising science uh, undermines the integrity and purpose of science. We've got to change that. And uh, it also blurs the boundary between uh, science and pseudoscience. And I see this day after day with our institutional scientists back home. I can see them bending the rules to make it look as if they're going to fit in with what the sponsor wanted for this and that and the other. Don't believe it. And, of course, it encourages what I've defined as pseudoscience. So we've, we've not only got to change our attitudes and, and build our confidence and, and talk to lay people, but we need to change how our science is conducted and how it is managed uh, in, in our society. Science needs to regain its rightful place. Uh, it needs to re return to a normative function. I find the truth. Uh, academic freedom must prevail. Back home, I know many scientists who would love to say the things I do, but they can't because they are trapped in their institution. That's not good for society. So society is best served when scientists are free to speak. Uh, and we need to tell our science managers to politely get stuff, we're not going down that path, we're gonna do this, uh, blah, blah, blah. We've got to be strong. So I'm going to leave it there, and I'm gonna leave you with a challenge. And your challenge is as expressed by Robert Park. Those who are fortunate enough to have chosen science as a career have an obligation to inform the public about voodoo science. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>